Hello to you and welcome to Adelante Chicago. I'm Lourdes Duarte. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bienvenidos. Well, designating dollars to help some of Chicago's largest Latino communities. There are two state legislators that are celebrating a recent win in Springfield that will guarantee millions of dollars will come to areas like Humboldt Park and Logan Square. And joining us to explain a little bit about this is one of the state senators here for Illinois, Cristina Pasiones Sayas, who's joining us today. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, when we talked last, you said this is the first time that we've got such a large chunk of money, $25 million, that will be designated specifically for our Latino communities. How is that happening? Yeah, so we were successful as the Latino caucus. There's mm -hmm. 16 members of us in the House and in the Senate combined um, to really make the case that, mm -hmm. you know, there has been underinvestment in our communities across the state. Obviously, like so many parts of the state, yeah. Chicago is experiencing, you know, an uptick in reported crime and violence. So we need to be very deliberate in terms of how we invest in the community and to make sure that those dollars are directed to organizations that serve the Latino okay. community. And we talk about places like Logan Square and Humboldt Park, but it's also many other communities, Little Village, Pilsen, they'll all be benefit from these dollars. I think it's interesting that people learn a little bit more about you because you've been in the state Senate for about the last year and a half, and mm -hmm. you're really focusing in on the data that's out out there that tells the story of what's happening in these neighborhoods. Absolutely. You know, my background has always um, been about kind of marrying the quantitative data with the lived experience. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because I had a lot of experience working in the early childhood space, looking at mm -hmm. um, violence data, juxtaposing it against educational outcomes, life outcomes, health outcomes, um, you know, I, I just kind of bring to bear that experience and work in the Senate. I think it's really important that that, um, you know, when we're looking at data, we're um, making the case and we're able to then be very deliberate about how we target and how we also monitor and get involved um, in the process of implementation because it's one thing to appropriate money, it's a whole nother thing to make sure that that money is getting out the door and being put to good use. Yeah, there's a lot of layers to making change happen, that's for sure. Okay, so let's talk about how we do make it happen because, okay, we've got the $25 million now that will go to different communities throughout the state, but then how do you make sure that it gets issued out to the appropriate places? So what happens next? Where do we go from here? So in the case of the 25 million, there were direct line items. These are grants that are going to be coming from the Illinois Criminal Justice um, Information Authority. Uh, these are ARPA dollars, which are the federal relief dollars as a result of COVID. They're able to be utilized kind of broadly. When we think about, you know, investments in violence prevention, we have to think about it is not only um, the street outreach intervention or case management services mm -hmm. for individuals who are returning um, from being justice involved. It's also mental and behavioral health. It's youth employment. It's youth development. It's an array of things um, that these organizations have kind of a history of being mm -hmm. able to provide. And so we're working with ICJA to make sure that those processes are streamlined, um, that, you know, this is for fiscal year 23, so that starts July 1, um, but ultimately that the organizations are teed up to be able to, like I said, put their kind of plans in place. I met with groups across the Northwest side to understand what services do you provide? How long have you been doing it? What geographies do you cover? What gaps do you have? So it was really easy to kind of make the case because I had the data in terms of, you know, what we were experiencing mm -hmm. with violence, what had not been invested in the past, and then what gaps could we close should there be resources available. Yeah. And I thought you did such a, a beautiful job before the show explaining what is happening in many of these communities where we're seeing some gentrification and that's oftentimes because of that we're losing out on some dollars or maybe it doesn't look as bad for the community, right? Like maybe those neighborhoods look a little bit better and the money's not needed. So explain what, what you were referring to. Sure. On the northwest side of Chicago, um, you know, sometimes we kind of have this double-edged sword happening, right? Mm -hmm. Gentrification is something that we've been battling for decades. And it sometimes makes our community in aggregate look like it's more affluent than what it is. But actually what we're doing is we are displacing historically 
Latino um, predominant communities. We are deconcentrating our power as a collective to advocate. And then when you have members of street organizations that are literally being like pushed in different directions, sometimes that sparks up the violence, right? On top of the compounding factors and the stress. Um, the and, pandemic, and, all those other things. Exactly. Yeah. All of that kind of comes together. And so um, it was really important to kind of like uncover the nuanced way that we need to look at this type of work because when we talk about violence prevention and public safety, we have to talk about community investments and we have to talk about what that looks like holistically, how it is going to take time to mm -hmm. see some significant change. A lot of these problems didn't happen overnight. Um, therefore, they're not going to be resolved overnight. But thriving communities mm -hmm. have a lot to do with when we have, you know, a physically safe environment, a clean air, clean water, green space, but we also have access to high quality education, health care, economic justice, housing, all of that comes together in this Work. Yeah, a lot of moving parts when we talk about our communities and our neighborhoods. You mentioned the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus, which is so important in making so many of these things happen. What else is coming down the line? What else are you guys working on? What else are you looking at as um, a possible area where we need to address or uh, needs to be addressed in our neighborhoods? So the Latino Legislative Caucus actually has a document that we have produced called Raices, Roots. Yeah. And what it does is organize kind of our priorities that come directly from the community to help us kind of um, shape and prioritize how we actually um, legislate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have an area around economic justice. We have an area around equity and education, area around health and immigration and housing. All of those um, kind of components have like multifaceted pieces mm -hmm. that we've advanced. And we also have sort of like almost a dashboard sure. to show what we have been able to accomplish since we put out the Raices document two years ago, and now where we're at today. So it's everything under the sun <laughs> in terms of how we are trying to make sure that our community is strong, it is, you know, thriving, and it is constantly, you know, we're on the kind of pulse yeah. of what the needs are. Yeah, well, for years you guys have been doing great work, and we hope that continues. We know it will continue. There is a lot of work still left to be done. So thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you.